Uh, my lab is mainly a cell biology lab, and uh, we are focusing on, uh, on, on the mechanism that uh, regulate uh, integrin mediated uh, uh, cell adhesion in vascular endothelial cells, and we are mainly interested in characterizing the mechanisms that regulate uh, uh, the interaction of uh, uh, integrins uh, uh, with extracellular matrix. And uh, uh, in the, it doesn't work. No. Okay. In, the, in the last 10 years, we mainly focused on, uh, on negative uh, uh, regulators of uh, integrin function. And uh, as I will show you, this is equally important as a positive regulator of integrin function. And uh, this is particularly relevant uh, uh, for uh, the, to understand the mechanism that regulate the architecture of blood vessels, which uh, uh, largely depends uh, uh, on the regulation of integrins. And uh, as I will show you, this, this depends both on the conformational regulation of integrin affinity for the extracellular matrices, but uh, also uh, in, on the regulation of uh, integrin traffic. This is something uh, recent for us, uh, at least in terms of, of, uh, of the research of our lab, but as I will show you, we, we, we found that, that these two uh, aspects, meaning conformation and traffic, are tightly intermingled in, in the cell. Um, we are working in a cancer institute. We are mainly focused in trying to understand the, the cell biology of basic aspects that are important for cancer development. And one crucial aspect is represented by the fact that the tumor vasculature, if you compare it to the normal vasculature, is highly disrupted in terms of architecture, but also in terms of functionality. And uh, in particular, you have several uh, drawbacks from this uh, 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 disrupted structure. Um, mainly, the oxygen is, is, is quite low and is poorly uh, transferred uh, to, to, the, to the tumor tissue, so you have a hypoxia. This is causing, for example, downregulation of ecadirin. Uh, upregulation of metatyrosine kinase receptor, and this is these are all pro-invasive aspects. And you have also leaky vessels, and so you have, a, a, again, a, a, another factor that can uh, uh, promote uh, 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 invasion. And uh, another uh, aspect, crucial aspect, is that these, uh, these uh, disrupted blood vessels are poorly uh, efficient in uh, uh, delivering uh, uh, anti-cancer drugs. So that's the reason why uh, we want to understand uh, the molecular basis of this disruption, and we do think that, in particular, uh, uh, um, alteration in the interaction in between the, the endothelium and the extracellular matrix uh, uh, could be crucial uh, to, to, to cause this uh, abnormal vasculature. And uh, in, in, the, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, mainly work from, mainly from the lab of Rakesh Jain in Boston, uh, suggested that uh, a, a good uh, approach uh, in, in cancer therapy could be to try to normalize these abnormal blood vessels. And so also, from this point of view, from this uh, uh, um, therapeutical approach, a key uh, uh, aspect is that of defining and identifying vascular normalizing factors. Um, as I told you, uh, a major determinant uh, uh, um, of the vascular architecture uh, is uh, uh, represented uh, uh, by the interaction of endothelial cells with the extracellular matrix. And why? Mainly because we know that uh, uh, another important factor is the blood flow. So if you block the blood flow, if you, if you alter the blood flow in, in an embryo, for example, you can impair the, the, the remodeling of the vasculature for this uh, primary capillary plexus in a hierarchically organized vascular tree. 
And uh, so the blood flow is signaling the remodeling. But how is the blood flow signaling the remodeling? The blood flow is signaling the remodeling because the flow, uh, the shear, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, actually stimulating the endothelial cells. And in particular, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, activating a mechanical uh, sensor which is mainly uh, uh, represented by uh, molecules that are involved either in the cell to cell in contact or in the cell to matrix contact. In particular, we are interested in this aspect in the way the, uh, uh, the, this kind of uh, uh, mechanical information is transferred uh, to integrin adhesive receptor. And the integrin adhesive receptors are major uh, uh, transducers of this uh, 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 fluid uh, shear stress that is a major determinant of uh, um, the vascular remodeling. So as, Ma as um, uh, uh, Mauro was recalling before, almost 10 years ago, uh, uh, we, we found that uh, uh, in the endothelial cells, there are autocrine uh, loops of a semaphorins that are uh, vascular, uh, that are uh, guidance cues originally <laughs> identified in the, in the nervous system and that we found to be uh, um, involved also in vascular remodeling, not only in the, in the formation of the nervous system. And uh, in particular, what we observed at the time was that these uh, uh, autocrine loops were of class 3 semaphorin were crucial to regulate the remodeling of the vasculature. And a major signaling output of the of semaphorins was represented by the regulation of integrin mediated endothelial cell adhesion to the extracellular matrix. Uh, the reason why we focused on semaphorins uh, uh, was uh, uh, that uh, um, actually a, a major regulator, at least at that time, it was one of of the most major regulator, now we know that other molecules are, of course, involved, was represented by this protein, which is a small GTPase name, named RRAS. Uh, an interesting aspect, at least for us, vascular biologists, is the fact that RRAS is uh, expressed at high levels in endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells. And uh, in 1996, Erki Roslati uh, showed how RRAS was a a positive regulator of integrin function. On the, on the cell surface, integrin comes in, at least in two flavors. Mainly, they can be bent or inactive, not able to bind the extracellular matrix, and or extended and able to bind the extracellular matrix. So um, what they were observing, actually, at that time was that overexpressing RAS was increasing uh, the ability of an integrins to bind uh, the extracellular matrix. And so we, dis we were looking for negative regulators of integrin function because we thought that they could be important uh, regulator of vascular remodeling. And we focused on semaphorins, mainly class 3 semaphorins, these dimeric proteins that are secreted, then, and they can bind on the surface of endothelial cells a core receptor that is named neuropilin 1, and then transduce through another receptor, which is plexin. And we were attracted by plexins in particular because they display a unique and very peculiar cytoplasmic domain that contain a RAS gap. At the time, was a bona fide RAS gap uh, domain. That is, a GTPase activating protein domain that is able to switch RAS from its GTP to its GDP form. And so that was what we showed at the time. What we, what we showed was that semaphorin through plexin was impinging on integrin uh, activation and was regulating uh, uh, integrins in endothelial cells and vascular remodeling in vivo. One year later, uh, uh, the group of Najishi uh, showed uh, indeed that the, the, the cytoplasmic domain of plexins uh, is a, an RAS gap domain that and display an enzymatic activity on RAS. And uh, however, uh, over the years, we learned that another important regulator of integrin function is represented by this protein that is named tailin. And the tailin um, can bind uh, integrins uh, 
and activate them. And this occurs because tailing gets activated in turn, is regulated. And uh, be before binding integrins, it has to be activated by another small GTPase, that is RAP1, that through an effector, which is known as RIAM1, uh, activates tailing. And very recently, uh, 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 Wang and colleagues showed that the cytoplasmic domain of plexin display also a second gap activity, also on RAP1. So the point is that uh, semaphorin through plexin are major regulator of integrin function. And this is occurring through the gap activity both on RAS and on, on, on RAP1. So uh, we can basically monitor uh, the activation, uh, conformational activation of integrins thanks to the antibodies that the community in particular, the laboratory of Martin Humphreys generated over the years. And there are some antibodies, such as the one that I'm listing here, that can recognize epitopes that are selectively exposed on active integrins. In particular, alpha-5, beta-1, which is the major fibronectin receptor, can be recognized, for example, by SNACA-51 that recognizes the uh, active alpha-5 uh, subunit, or 9EG7 or 12G10 that recognize the extended uh, uh, um, uh, beta-1 subunit. Uh, unfortunately, most of these antibodies works mainly on human, and uh, only one of these antibodies, 9EG7, is also working on mice. So this is somehow restricting the possibility to applicate these antibodies in uh, studies in, in, in mice. However, using 9EG7 in collaboration with Enrico Giraud and Federica Maione in our institute, um, and also with, uh, with Mauro, Mauro Giacca here, uh, we uh, analyzed uh, um, semaphorin signaling and integrin activation in a transgenic mouth model of cancer known as RIPTEG mice. And, and you know that RIPTEG mainly uh, uh, expressed the S SV40 large the antigen under the insulin promoter, and this is causing uh, uh, cancer in the uh, progression that transformed the normal islet, the beta cells, insulin expressed in beta cells of the normal islet over the time, first in an angiogenic islet and then in an islet carcinoma. And uh, from the fifth week, uh, week uh, on, uh, angiogenesis is active there, and it continues also during uh, uh, the carcinoma progression. Now, with Enrico, by using the antibody uh, recognizing 9EG7, what we realize is that in the endothelial cells, not at the angiogenic islet stage, but later in the carcinoma, we have a beta-1 superactivation in, uh, in tumor endothelial cells. This means that the amount of beta active beta-1 integrin is really very, very high. And Interestingly, this uh, 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 fits uh, uh, with uh, um, the fact that uh, uh, while uh, in the normal vasculature the levels of uh, SEMA3A are low, at the angiogenic switch, SEMA3A, exactly as we observed in the embryo, is increasing. But then, uh, when the tumor uh, progression continues, uh, it is switched off. And this is switching off uh, is uh, sharply fitting with the beta-1 integrin superactivation. And so what we think is that the, 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 the shutoff of semaphorins during tumor angiogenesis uh, is responsible for the beta-1 superactivation. And the beta-1 superactivation, as I will show you in a while, uh, is, uh, uh, we think, responsible for the malformation of the vasculature and the poor functionality due to the fact that mainly the cells, endothelial cells, become insensitive to the blood flow, so they, the blood vessels are no longer remodeled and optimized in response to the blood flow. And indeed, if you, if you look at the vasculature uh, of the, of, of the RIPTEG mice in cancer, uh, uh, it, it is, is, is really chaotic and, uh, and poorly organized, and if you treat uh, these mice, uh, by delivering uh, semaphorase through the AAV8 uh, 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 virus um, produced here in Trieste by, by Mauro Giacca and Lorena Zentilin, 
uh, what, you, what you can get is this one. Mainly you, what you can get is, is the normalization of the vasculature uh, and a pruning and a real optimization of the, of the blood vessels that become much more linear. I, I don't have the time. This is our published work to go in detail here, but the, these blood vessels are much more covered by smooth muscle cells and more recently we, we published another work in which we, we described how these are also uh, less leaky and, uh, and uh, all this, and this transition correlates with the, a transition from an hypoxic environment to an ormoxic environment. So basically what it occurs is that when we treat with SEMA 3A compared to the starting tumors, we basically, in terms of tumor volume, we have a stable disease, whereas control-treated animals uh, display larger tumors after two weeks of treatment. And what is important is that uh, control-treated mice die around the 14 week of age, while SEMA 3A mice uh, uh, survive longer. And uh, uh, at that time, we found, uh, uh, and we recently confirmed, something like nine weeks more. We are almost doubling the, uh, the life of, of these mice. And uh, now we have uh, shown that uh, uh, this treatment can be combined with other treatment, and there, there could be a synergy. So really, SEMA 3A, we think, is a, is a, is a way to normalize the tumor vasculature and, uh, 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 and uh, to, to, it's, to our knowledge, is one of the, is the first uh, uh, and really uh, uh, um, agent able uh, uh, normalizing aging, able to uh, prolong so much the survival, at least in this, uh, uh, in this model. So what we think is basically that you have an antagonism in between semaphorins and other uh, factors, such as VGF. Uh, they are, of course, anti-angiogenic and pro-angiogenic factors, but we do think that they are, they are also important regulator of integrin function. And semaphorins are negative regulators, and VGF and chemokines are positive regulators of integrin function. And we think that this balance is required to regulate the maturation from the primary capillary plexus in the, uh, uh, in the normal uh, and, and hierarchically organized vascular tree that characterize the embryos. Now, what we think is occurring is that in cancer, this balance is disrupted, not only because, as we already know from work of others, uh, VGF is really increased in these tumors that are hypoxic, and VGF is really increased by hypoxia, but another aspect is that sema 3 is switched off. We don't really know now which is the mechanism. We know it is, it, this is a, a transcriptional switch off, but we don't know yet uh, how this is occurring. And when we reintroduce the semaphore and we are putting, again, the system in balance, and we, we know, I didn't show you, but we know that we are reducing the amount of active integrins, and uh, uh, this is uh, correlating with uh, the normalization of the vasculature, uh, the formation of a normoxic cancer tissue, and this is, is characterized by reduced volume, significant extension of survival, and very recently, uh, we showed that, that uh, uh, SEMA 3A is inhibiting uh, the metastatization. We do think that at least in part this inhibition of metastatization is due to the fact that we are generating an ormoxic environment less pro-metastatic. So now let's, uh, uh, let's go to uh, another uh, aspect or a new aspect that we characterized in the last three years with uh, with my group, uh, this is a work mainly by Francesca Cavare, former postdoc that left the lab, together with Chiara Sandri, very talented post, uh, PhD student, and with the collaboration of Donatella Vardlembri, Chiara Camillo, and Martina Santambrogio. So uh, we are a cell biology lab, as I told you, and we, uh, in the last year, we mainly focused on our RAS because it, it, it is important. It is a key factor in the semaphorin signaling. And uh, it is expressed in endothelial cells, and it is not clear, it was not clear up to now how it was involved in the regulation of an integrin function. So this was, the, our aim was to clarify this issue. 
We did a, a yeast to hybrid system, a simple yeast to hybrid system with a constitutive uh, active RAS, and uh, what uh, we pick up uh, uh, is uh, this protein, which is named uh, RIN2. So it stands for RAS and uh, RAB uh, uh, interactor 2 protein. Um, it was or already um, identified as a protein able to interact with the RAS proteins, but nobody really uh, uh, understood um, in detail how this protein was uh, signaling downstream of, uh, uh, of RAS proteins. Uh, it belongs to a wider family, uh, and uh, among uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the member of this family, while uh, 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 RIN1 is most in the nervous system, RIN3 in the hematopoietic system, RINL in lung, spleen, thymus, muscle. Uh, RIN2 is rather ubiquitous. And it is uh, formed by, from the end to end terminus, by an SH2 domain, uh, proline rich domains, uh, RIN homology domain that it is shared by the whole family. BPS9 domain, which is a bona fide uh, um, RAB5 guanosine exchange factor domain, and the RAS binding domain. So basically what uh, we confirmed was that uh, indeed our RAS, in particular its constitutively active form, was able to bind through the array domain RIN2, uh, but not, for example, the dominant negative version of our RAS. And the RAB5, uh, and as confirmed, uh, as found, or already found in the literature, uh, was also able to bind uh, RIN2. Uh, but uh, for example, another RAB GTPase, uh, uh, RAB7, was uh, much less efficient in binding. And uh, we are still trying to generate a good antibody anti RIN2, but we had to work with the HA. HA tagged uh, a version of RIN2 because uh, uh, antibodies uh, uh, for, uh, uh, in particular for immunofluorescence are not uh, available. We have some uh, anti uh, RIN2 antibodies that work uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Western blot immunoprecipitation but not in uh, um, immunofluorescence. So the HA tagged RIN2 uh, when transfected with the RAS38V in endothelial cells localized mainly in two locations. So you can find it here at the cell periphery in these lamellipodial structures, in this accumulation at the cell periphery indicated by this uh, uh, arrowhead. Or you can uh, find it uh, as indicated by these uh, dashed uh, uh, arrows on vesicles and uh, RAS, you can find RAS also on vesicles and uh, at the lamellipodial structure. You can also find RAS sometimes, not always. This is a selected picture, let's say. In these more elongated structures that are focal adhesions, but this is, uh, I mean, you have to add a lot of extracellular metrics, so we, we don't know how much physiological is the localization of RAS in these structures. However, RIN2 is not in focal adhesion. Um, just to remind you, focal adhesions are not all equal, and so um, here you have an example of how they can form. So if you imagine that this is a lamellipodium of uh, migrating cells, migrating cell, uh, um, the, lamell the lamellipodium is formed mainly because uh, the activity of the RAC GTPase that uh, through the wave stimulates the branched network of actin uh, formation. And this uh, correlates with the formation of these spot, uh, spotty-like uh, nascent adhesions. These nascent adhesions form at the periphery, and then since the actin is polymerizing at the, at the periphery, and, and it continues to polymerize at the periphery, uh, you have basically a retrograde, blood, a retrograde flow of actin. And so this nascent adhesion, uh, uh, which are very small, start to move toward the cell center, and then either they, they, they disappear, or when they arrive at the bottom of at the central part of this uh, branched network, 
uh, get uh, in, in contact or stimulate the polymerization of these long acting cables that are stress fibers. And so this spot, this nascent adhesion, start to maturate in mature uh, adhesions that are usually named the focal adhesions or the long. Uh, I'm telling this because it's peculiar, because ring 2 is localizing in nascent adhesion, but not in focal adhesion. And so if you, if you, if you focus on this uh, lamellipodium here, uh, these are endothelial cells transfected with RIN2 and with, with vinculin. Vinculin is a protein that localizes both in nascent adhesion and in focal adhesion. And uh, so, as you can see here, first of all, in the focal adhesion, this long and thick structure, vinculin is there, but RIN2 is not there. But if you look to nascent adhesion at the cell periphery, you will see that they appear in waves. I mean, you have a first wave, then the retraction, then the second wave, and then the retraction. Here you basically have, you can recognize two waves. This is the, fir this is the first wave that is flowing back, and then you have a, a, a second new wave that is f just formed here. And as you can see, ring two is on localized very sharply on both waves. One interesting aspect is that this is the transition area, the transition from which the nascent adhesion transforms in focal adhesion. As then you can see here, when the nascent adhesion are moving back and, and uh, uh, connected with the stress fibers and transform in focal adhesion due to the contractility that is dependent on rho and uh, which activate myosin 2, uh, RIN2 is somehow sorted out, okay? So there is a mechano-transduction event, event that is uh, somehow uh, uh, sorting out RIN2 from the matura at the maturation step. And this is a, an analysis just to tell you uh, that you can see this quite clearly. So basically, if you look at these uh, structures here and, and, you, and you trace a, a, a line here, and then you can and you look at RIN2, you will see that RIN2 is... A, nicely localized, co-localized with the vinculin in the, in the nascent adhesion, but then when in the part that is uh, maturing into, into a focal adhesion, uh, RIN2 then starts to be uh, sorted out. Um, another location where you can find RIN2 is on vesicles here, and uh, these vesicles are RAB5 positive. Oops. RAB5 positive early endosomes. And uh, um, an interesting aspect is that in addition to the RAB5 positive early endosome, you can see a very faint, actually, a localization of RIN2 when you overexpress uh, RAB5, uh, of RAB5, sorry, when you overexpress RIN2 also at the, at the leading edge. This is something very peculiar, and I will show you later. Uh, how this can occur, because usually uh, the, the, cell, the plasma membrane is black. RAB5 is all, all, only on, uh, uh, on early endosome. But uh, so this is a, a, another picture that shows you the nascent adhesion uh, that forms at the lamellipodium and that then, then mature in the, in the in focal adhesion at the interface uh, at the, uh, with the what is called lamellum. So this, this maturation depends on non-muscle myosin 2, which is activated downstream of, uh, of, uh, of rho. Now, you can inhibit, directly inhibit non-muscle myosin 2 uh, by treating cells with the inhibitor blebistatin. So you block, basically, the maturation. And if you block the maturation, you see that you are causing a more evident accumulation of RAB5, which it, it seems faint, but it, it, is really, it is really not so much faint for RAB5 because this is really um, something you never observe. Um, and it co-localized there with RIN2 and with vinculin, of course, and of course the two can be found also on, on, on endosomes. So another important aspect is that if you look at uh, RIN2, and you pull down, uh, basically, from cell extract uh, uh, RIN2, 
with uh, RAB5, GST RAB5 loaded with GTP or G GDP or GTP uh, gamma S, which is a GTP form that is, cannot be cleaved, you see that RIN2, and this is also something peculiar, display a much higher affinity for the GTP bound form. This is peculiar because the GAF usually should bind with higher affinity to a GDP bound form. And this is uh, something peculiar. The second aspect, uh, which is also peculiar, is the following. So if you measure the GAF activity, that is the ability of uh, uh, RIN2 to cause the, uh, the dissociation of uh, the GDP label, the uh, GDP from RAB5, uh, this is what you observe. So basically, you, in this experiment, we have RAB5 alone loaded with uh, uh, radioactive GTP. And this is uh, the basal, uh, 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 let's say, uh, release of GTP over time. Then, uh, if you add RIN2, what you are observing is that a stronger increase in the amount of GTP that is released. If you, together with RIN2, you add another RAS protein other than uh, a RAS, mainly HRAS, which also binds RIN2, you do not see much difference. But importantly, when you add a RAS, basically, uh, what you are observing is a dramatic inhibition of the, uh, uh, of the release. So what does it mean? We, we do think that basically RAS, it is doing uh, 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 two things. The first one is that uh, once it is targeted to the nascent adhesion sites, we think there are data from the literature that suggest the integrins through uh, ras gaf can activate RAS. RAS then recruits RIN2, and then RIN2, which is recruited there, is recruiting RAB5. And it is important to, to switch off the activity of uh, 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 the GAF activity of RAB5 to allow its sort of, if you want, transformation into an adapter that is able to bind with high affinity uh, RAB5 GTP there. And, RAP5, and to concentrate RAB5 GTP in proximity of integrins. But how is uh, RIN2 regulating all this uh, uh, phenomena? Meaning, uh, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, RIN2 mediates the association uh, of uh, RAS and RAB5 meaningful in, for the regulation of endothelial? cell addition to the extracellular matrix, which is mediated by integrins. So what we did was basically to knock down RIN2 in endothelial cells. And what you observe really is that they display a dramatically reduced ability in uh, adhering to various uh, extracellular matrix proteins. And if you overexpress a RAS wild type compared to wild type cells, if you overexpress uh, uh, control cells, I mean, uh, if you uh, overexpress a RAS wild type, you strongly increase the adhesion of these cells uh, to uh, different extracellular matrix proteins. But if you simultaneously reduce, if you simultaneously silence RIN2, uh, RAS is no longer able to stimulate this adhesion. And if you introduce the constitutively active RAS, you have an even stronger induction but also of adhesion. But also in this case, RIN2, the silencing of RIN2 is really impairing the induction of this cell adhesion. So this is telling us that our RAS is promoting cell adhesion through RIN2. Um, ad works by others, mainly by Ioanni Vasca, uh, showed that also RAB5 is an inducer of cell adhesion. And indeed, we were able to replicate it, to reproduce uh, her data. And when we overexpress RAB5 in endothelial cells, they adhere much more to uh, several uh, extracellular matrix protein, fibronectin, collagen, vitronectin. But then, if you silence her in two, RAB5 is basically no longer able to induce uh, cell adhesion in endothelial cells. And uh, even much more interesting, if you also silence a RAS, uh, the uh, uh, RAB5 is no longer able 
to induce adhesion. So this is telling us that these three guys, mainly uh, uh, RAS, RIN2, and RAB5, are working together in promote and induce uh, uh, endothelial uh, uh, cell adhesion. So basically, we can conclude that the RAS promotes endothelial cell adhesion via RIN2 and RAB5, and vice versa, RAB5 promotes endothelial cell adhesion via RIN2 and RAS. So this is telling us that we have a complex, a unit here, that is responsible for the regulation of integrin mediated cell adhesion. But how is it occurring? Uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, we started uh, uh, to evaluate the contribution of the different uh, RIN2 domains uh, to the RIN2 proadhesive activity. And so we perform silencing and rescue experiments. So if you silence RIN2, you basically uh, uh, inhibit the ability of endothelial cells to adhere. But then if you rescue with the silencing resistant RIN2, you can, well, type RIN2, you can rescue, fully rescue. However, if you delete either the RAB5 binding domain or the uh, uh, RRAS binding domain, both deletion uh, uh, cause uh, mainly uh, the, the full inability of RIN2 in rescuing. So uh, the RAB5 binding domain of RIN2 and the RAS binding domain of RIN2 are fully required for its uh, ability to uh, influence uh, endothelial cell adhesion. But how these constructs, how these domains are regulating the physiology of the of, uh, of RAS and RAB5 and uh, function. So if you, if you transfect RIN2, RAB5, and RAS in endothelial cells, as I told you, you can find them in the spreading cells uh, in the lamellipodia at the cell periphery, but uh, you can also find them on vesicles, okay? So these cells doesn't display so much lamellipodia, but displays uh, um, and, uh, endosomes. And on endosomes, you can see that you have RAB5, you have RIN2, and on the same endosomes, you, you can also have a RAS. This is, however, with full length uh, RIN2. Now, if you employ a RIN2 that is lacking uh, the RH and VPS9 domains that mediate the association of RIN2 uh, uh, with uh, RAB5, what you are seeing is basically a dissociation of these three proteins. So while this RIN2 mutant still able to bind the RAS goes with RAS here on these vesicular compartments, which is, however, different from the RAB5 compartment. So this is telling us that the ability of RIN2 to bind both RAB5 and the RAS is required to drive RAS on RAB5-positive endosomes. Okay. Vice versa, if you delete uh, the RAS binding domain, what you will see is that RIN2 is binding RAB5, so it is on the RAB5 positive endosome, but again, RAS is not there. RAS is localized in another compartment. By the way, we know that this compartment is the RAB7 late endosomal compartment. So we think that the ability of RIN2 to bring together RAB5 and RAS is mainly causing the relocation or the is prolonging uh, the ability of a RAS to localize for a long period of time on early endosomes. Otherwise, a RAS is passing from early endosomes to late endosomes. So since uh, we are observing here that uh, RIN2 is bringing RAB5 at the, uh, at the lamellipodium with nascent adhesion R, uh, and uh, RIN2 and RAS are together with the RAB5 at the lamellipodium and on endosomes, then next we wonder at whether uh, these uh, two proteins, mainly RAS and RIN2, could influence endothelial internalization. And to do this, we, did, we followed this uh, simple uh, uh, mm, uh, experimental strategy, which is based on the use of this cleavable biotin that display a disulfide bridge. So you can label the cells at four degrees for 30 minutes. Then you allow 
uh, the, the surface protein you are labeling, basically. Then you allow the surface protein to get internalized by putting cells for different time points at 37 degrees. Then you, you, you bring back the cells at four degrees. You strip the surface with the, with the reducing agent. And then uh, you will have uh, biotin labeled only the internalized protein. And then you can recover them with antibodies. And then you can follow the internalization of uh, your proteins. And we follow the integrins. As I told you, we have active integrins and inactive integrins. So with an anti so active integrins are a small percentage, mainly 5-10%, while the, most of the integrins are inactive in the cells. And what we observe, basically, this is the internalization, the progressive internalization of total beta-1 integrins, so mainly inactive integrins. Basically, if you silence our RAS, this is the red column, you do not see any statistically significant difference. And the same is true if you silence RIN2. Now, the point is that in the nascent adhesion, you have active integrins, and you can monitor them with the antibodies that I told you before. So if you use 9EG7 to monitor beta-1 active integrins, what you observe is that if you silence our RAS, you, are, you have a statistically significant inhibition of integrin, active integrin internalization. The same is true for RIN2. So RIN2 and the RAS are inhibiting, are, 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 are controlling, are inducing the internalization of active integrins, we think, at nascent adhesion sites, uh, but not elsewhere, because the total integrins, which are elsewhere, are really uh, not affected. Moreover, uh, if you compare, so this is again, a, a, this is a, an a, a, a epistasis uh, essay in which we try to understand if RIN2 could be required for the internalization of active integrins downstream of RAS. So in, this is the internalization of active beta-1 integrins in control cells. If you silence RIN2, as I told you before, you have a, a decrease in the internalization. If you overexpress a RAS, as expected, somehow you strongly increase the internalization of active integrins. But if you simultaneously silence RIN2, a RAS is no longer able to activate, to induce the internalization of uh, active integrins. And again, you can use either wild type a RAS, or you can use constitutively active RAS. The result is similar. At some time points, it's higher. But again, also in this case, RIN2 is able to uh, counteract the TET also of the constitutively active RAS. Another important aspect is that neither RAS or RIN2 silences was modifying uh, the, the surface level of active integrins or of total integrins. So RAS is not acting as RAP1 as an inducer of integrin activation, conformational activation at the cell surface, but RAS is rather inducing the internalization of active integrins. So I can skip this because otherwise we are going late. And so that's what I was telling you. Basically, the semaphorin signaling is impinging on RAP1, inhibiting RAP1 that controls integrin activation. And it is also impinging on RAS, but RAS is regulating the internalization of active integrins, but not of inactive integrins. And uh, what we think is that, why is this internalization important? I mean, because this is the, uh, the, best correlates, uh, the best correlation that we have with the regulation of integrin function. So why is this important? One hypothesis is that there could be a sort of treadmill that is important to allow the remodeling of adhesion sites. And this is important when cells have to spread and to migrate. If you block this treadmill, you can block basically the, the, di the dynamics of the adhesive sites and the half-life of the integrin on the surface. But an alternative hypothesis is that there could be a pro-adhesive signaling here occurring. Also because the active integrins can get internalized with the uh, extracellular matrix, and we know from literature based on mainly on tyrosine kinase receptors that ligand bound tyrosine kinase receptor can signal from endosomes. So some pro adhesive signal could, could occur here. And our favorite candidate was represented by RAC for several reasons. 
because uh, as I will show you, Iraq has been found made by Giorgio Shita and, and, uh, uh, and per Paolo Di Fiore to be activated on endosomes, but also because uh, Iraq uh, is a positive regulator of uh, cell-mediated adhesion, and uh, it is uh, 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 mainly uh, uh, a strong uh, inducer of uh, actin polymerization and nascent adhesion formation. As I told you, uh, Pierpaolo Di Fiore showed indeed that uh, uh, RAB5 uh, could drive uh, RAC1 activation on early endosome via TIAM1, which is a RAC GAF that can localize here. And this is important uh, for the activation of RAC downstream of RAB5. So the first things we did was basically to see if the overexpression of RAC QL could somehow uh, um, a rescue the, in the, 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 the activation of, uh, uh, of integrins, uh, of uh, integrin mediated cell adhesion. And this was the case. So this is the, basically the, 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 uh, um, the silencing of RIN2 that is mainly uh, down-regulating the, the ability of endothelial cells to adhere on, on, on extracellular matrices that can be rescued by, uh, by, by, by RAC uh, QL. Actually, RAC QL can also induce uh, endothelial uh, 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 adhesion, but uh, the, when RAC QL is overexpressed, the silencing of RIN2 is not so much effective in, 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 in reducing the adhesion. So what we think is that indeed RAC1 can be a downstream effector here, Another important aspect, this is somehow redundant with what Pierpaolo and, and Giorgio found, but however, here we show, they showed that uh, overexpressing RAB5 was, was relocalizing RAC1 on uh, uh, endosomes. And here we show that by overexpressing RIN2 and RAS, we are also relocating RAC1 on endosomes. And uh, so the point is that uh, uh, RIN2 could be involved uh, in the activation of RAC1 on endosomes. And indeed, uh, when we silence RIN2 and we pull down RAC GTP, what we observed was that uh, um, the silencing of RIN2 was basically inhibiting, strongly inhibiting the activation uh, of RAC1. As reported by the literature, when we overexpress our RAS, we are almost doubling the activation of RAC1. And if you were simultaneously uh, silencing RIN2, this increase was strongly reduced. Finally, what we did was uh, to try to understand how RIN2 was thus mediating the activation of uh, RAC1. And so we performed silencing rescue experiments, as I showed you before for cell adhesion. And what we observe is that basically uh, RIN2 wild type was able to rescue the uh, uh, re reduction in RAC1 activation down, um, caused by RIN2 silencing. But interestingly, the uh, mutant that are not able to bind RAP5 or RAS were not only not, not, not able uh, to rescue, but they were even displaying a sort of dominant negative effect. And we are observing, I didn't show you, but we are observing something similar on cell adhesion. So what we have here uh, is thus a model in which uh, uh, RRAS via RIN2 is relocated on endosomes. This depends on these two domain, RAB5 binding domain, RAS binding domain, and this is important for the, of course, integrin endocytosis, but above all later for the activation of RAC on endosomes. Um, as I showed you before, TIAM1, and I'm, I'm going to finish, uh, TIAM1 uh, is a, a RAC GAF. Uh, it is important because uh, in addition, in addition uh, uh, to uh, the DH uh, uh, RAC activating domain, it displays a RAS binding domain, and it also displays these pH binding domains. 
An interesting aspect is that the pH binding domain of T TIAM1 is not binding every, P every phosphatidyl inositol, but specifically with high affinity, the phosphatidyl inositol 3 monophosphate. This 3 monophosphate is selectively present on early endosome, and it is produced downstream of RAB5 by a, 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 a phosphatidyl inositol kinase named VPS34. And thiam, as I told you, also bind uh, RAS proteins. And both the binding of the PIP3 and the RAS can stimulate the, uh, um, uh, the activity, the RAC uh, uh, GAF activity of thiam-1. So thiam-1 was, in a way, our ideal candidate because it was both binding RAS and was both localized on endosomes and was activating RAC on endosomes. And indeed, when we silence thiam-1, what we are observing, basically, is a severe uh, inhibition of the induction of cell adhesion by RIN2 overexpression, constituti or, or wild-type RAS overexpression, or RAB5 overexpression. And vice versa, uh, when we overexpress thiam-1, we are basically rescuing the uh, inhibition of cell adhesion caused by uh, uh, by RIN2 silencing. So this is, again, putting uh, TIAN1 downstream of RIN2. So our final model is the following. Therefore, what we think is that uh, our RAS, uh, 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 or better, RIN2, is bringing our RAS on early endosome. And uh, on this location, uh, there is an activation of proadhesive signals, and we think that the activation of TIAN1, which requires both uh, 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 RAS and the phosphatidyl inositol that is present on the endosomes, uh, is a major component. And this activation of RAC uh, is important to promote cell addition. Just to finish, I want to recall you that so this pathway our RAS, RIN2, and RAB5 is required for the selective internalization of in active integrins. And a uh, couple of years ago, we showed another part of this pathway, which is uh, uh, that uh, uh, involves neuropilin 1 that favors, similarly to our RAS, RIN2, the internalization of active but not inactive integrins. And, uh, uh, in the cytoplasmic domain of neuropilin 1, there is the ability to, to uh, drive the localization here of some proteins, such as GYPSI1, that cause the accumulation of RAB5 and myosin 6. And all these players, in particular neuropilin 1 and myosin 6, are required for active integral internalization. So we do think that there, are, there is a dedicated signaling system that is controlling the, active, the internalization and the traffic and the signaling of active integrins, which is completely different and, uh, 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 from the, the system that is triggering the activation, uh, the, the internalization of inactive integrins. So I would like just to uh, uh, acknowledge the, the, all the, 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 the grants and the, the charities that are supporting us the many people that collaborated with us over the years. And uh, uh, I would like in particular to thank you, Enrico Giraudo and, and Mauro, for uh, all the works we did uh, uh, in vivo with the semaphorin signaling in vivo for the regulation of uh, vascular uh, uh, angiogenesis. And uh, Jim Norman and uh, Ioanni Vasca for uh, all the interaction about integrin traffic, Martin Humphries for all the antibodies uh, that uh, he is uh, providing us to monitor uh, the, the traffic of integrins. And Reinhard Fessler also, we are working with him uh, to understand how RIN2 is working in vivo. So thank you for your attention.